Hello, welcome to Sophie & Co. I'm Sophie Shevard Natsa. Over three years after the tragic earthquake and tsunami that shook Japan, there is still no peace for the victims. Whole towns fled in the wake of the catastrophe and have no hope of ever returning home. How do you cope with a catastrophe of this scale? Well, my guest today is the former mayor of the town of Futaba, which co-hosts the stricken Fukushima nuclear plant, Mr. Katsutaka Idogawa. On March 11, 2011, a powerful earthquake and tsunami shook Japan, causing one of the worst civil nuclear disasters in history. Despite relief efforts, radioactive material from the crippled Fukushima plant continues to flow into the surrounding environment. Once populated cities in the area are now ghost towns. Will it ever be safe to come back? Does the government still remember the victims of the crisis? Mr. Idogawa, thanks for being with us today. Now, your town of Futaba was heavily dependent on cash coming from the nuclear reactors. You yourself approved the building of more reactors. Now, did you believe back then that something could go wrong? Yes, I suspected it might, but I never expected an accident of such proportions. You said before that you knew right away that the government and TAPCO, the plant's operator, would lie about the consequences of the accident at Fukushima. When exactly did you lose trust in the authorities? Was it when the accident happened or was it after the accident, judging by the reaction of the government? This happened when I first met the management of the Fukushima power plant. I asked him about the possibilities of a nuclear accident, pretending that I didn't know anything about it. And it turned out they were unable to answer many of my questions. Frankly, that's when it first crossed my mind that their management didn't have a contingency plan. It was then I realized the facility could be dangerous. Mr. Iragama, um, I would like to go back in time. March 11th, 2011, the day of the devastating earthquake and tsunami that hit Japan. Where were you that day? What do you remember? I wasn't in Futaba that day. I was in a town nearby, on official business there. And that's when the earthquake hit. What exactly did you see around you then? As for the aftermath of the earthquake, there were no destroyed buildings or other wreckage. But I saw all that on my way back to Futaba. As soon as it happened, I jumped into my car and drove home. I managed to get there before the bigger tsunami came. It was only later that I realized that I escaped the massive wave. I do understand that when a catastrophe of this scale happens, it is very difficult to control your emotions, it is difficult to get hold of yourself, and it's really hard to know what exactly to do. But what were your first actions? The earthquake was very strong. I just kept thinking, if it's that strong, what will happen to the power plant? What if the reactor is damaged? What if there's a leak? What will the city do? What am I to do as mayor? I mean, I can only imagine how much worry you felt at that moment. But still, do you remember, what did you do right after the disaster hit? It took me 20 to 30 minutes to get back to my office in Futaba. There was a traffic jam, so I chose an alternative route along the coast. At that moment, I wasn't thinking about anything, except the fact that I had to get back as soon as possible. I heard a tsunami warning on my car radio. Tsunami waves in the area had never been higher than 60 centimeters before. I thought that even if it's big, the wave would be about 6 meters at most. I had no idea the road I was on could be washed away by the tsunami. I got lucky. The tsunami came after I drove off that road. I got to my office in Futaba and started checking for damage. I checked every floor, and on the fourth one, I looked out the window. Usually, you couldn't see the ocean from there, but at that point, it was just three to five hundred meters away. 
It was a truly terrifying sight. I had all these thoughts swirling in my head. What should I do? How do I evacuate people? Where do we run? How do we save ourselves? And I realized that the power plant would be damaged and didn't know what to do if I was serious. Looking back, I think I didn't deal with the crisis well enough. I think I did not ask myself enough questions. As I understand, you gave orders to evacuate the city right away. Yes, I didn't sleep at all that night. I was watching television since it was the only source of information. I kept thinking, what should we do about the radiation from Fukushima? How should I inform and evacuate people? Mobile phones didn't work because there was no signal, so radio was the only way to get any information across. On the morning of March 12th, I announced an emergency evacuation. I thought that radiation would not reach the mountains and we would be safe if we left the city. I told people to head to a town just 50 kilometers away, to Kawamata. There's just one road that goes there and it was packed with cars. Later, I learned that not all Futaba residents heard my announcement. I feel incredibly guilty about that. Back then, I believed that residents would be safe in Kawamata. It is much further away from the plant than the government recommended evacuation zone of 10 to 20 kilometers. Later, I found out that the Fukushima prefecture has withheld a lot of information. And now the government isn't taking any steps to ensure people's safety from radiation, and it isn't even monitoring the implementation of evacuation procedures. But you decided to evacuate people from Futaba as far as possible without consulting anybody. So you completely assumed responsibility. Our city always had an emergency plan in case of a fire or an accident at the plant. Every year we had special drills in case there's a fire at the plant. I think it's the central government and the Fukushima prefecture authorities that bear the brunt of responsibility for what happened. And as Futaba's mayor, it was my responsibility to take care of the people of my city. I had no time to get any advice. I tried talking to prefecture authorities, but there was absolute chaos. It was impossible to hold a meeting. So I chose to act on my own, and I decided to start with evacuating people as far from radiation as possible. Your town has moved to a new location, to the neighboring city of Iwaki. Is it safe there, and do you see this as a new start for these people? I'd like to show you a table with radiation levels around Chernobyl. Radiation levels around Fukushima are four times higher than in Chernobyl. So I think it's too early for people to come back to Fukushima prefecture. Here you can see radiation levels in our region uh, Tohoku. This is the epicenter of the earthquake. And the radiation radius is 50 to 100 kilometers, even 200 kilometers, in fact. Fukushima prefecture is at the very center of this. The city of Iwaki, where Futaba citizens moved, is also located in Fukushima prefecture. It is by no means safe, no matter what the government says. Exposing people to the current level of radiation in Fukushima is a violation of human rights. It's terrible. But nevertheless, evacuation advisories are started to be lifted for some cities in the Fukushima area. But you're saying that the government is allowing this despite the danger of radiation? The Fukushima prefecture has launched a come-home campaign. In many cases, evacuees are forced to return. Here's a map of Fukushima prefecture with areas hit by radiation highlighted in yellow and you can see that the color covers almost the entire map. Air contamination decreased a little, but soil contamination remains high. And there are still about 2 million people living in the prefecture who have all sorts of medical issues. The authorities claim this has nothing to do with the radiation fallout from Fukushima. But I demanded that the authorities substantiate their claim in writing. Yet they ignored my request. There are some terrible things going on in Fukushima. I remember being touched to the core by the plight of the victims of Chernobyl. 
I could barely hold back tears whenever I heard any reports about that terrible tragedy. And now, when a similar tragedy happened in Fukushima, there is no one to help us. We must not forget the lessons of Chernobyl. We must protect our children. I talked to local authorities in different places in Fukushima, but no one would listen to me. They believe what the government says, while in reality radiation is still there, and it is killing our children. They are dying of heart conditions, asthma, leukemia, thyroid complications. Lots of kids are extremely exhausted after school. Others are simply unable to attend PE classes. But the authorities are still hiding the truth from us, and I don't know why. Don't they have children of their own? It hurts so much to know that they can't protect our children. But I understand many children who have been evacuated are now living in the Fukushima district again. New schools have opened for these children, and you're saying that they're facing radiation there. Is anything being done to help the children affected by the nuclear fallout? Officially, both the central government and the prefecture authorities say there is no radiation. They're not doing anything, and they're not going to do anything. They say Fukushima Prefecture is safe, and that's why nobody's working to evacuate children, move them elsewhere. We're not even allowed to discuss this. All right, Mr. Dogawa, thank you. We're going to take a short break now. We'll be back soon with Mr. Idogawa, former mayor of the town that's home to the stricken Fukushima reactors to discuss how the governments handle the situation and what more there is to be done to contain the disaster. Stay with us. Tsutaka Idogawa, former mayor of Japan's town of Futaba, witness of the Fukushima nuclear disaster. Mr. Idogawa, thanks again for being with us. Um, so, after the tragedy, the government wanted to build nuclear waste storage facilities on the territory of Futaba. You were very much against that. But now, as I understand, these facilities are going to be built after all. Do you fear that that will prevent residents from ever returning to their town? The media reported as if the final decision has been already made, but that's not true. The problem lies with the decision-making process. That's why I keep saying, no, this won't fly. The central government makes all the decisions on its own. It acts as it pleases. In our country, decisions can't be made without taking people's opinion into consideration. But the government ignores this and just does everything the way they see fit. After all, this matter is up to landowners. Unless they agree, nothing can happen. That's how things work in Japan. And even though there's been much speculation, nobody has talked to landowners yet. So, media reports suggesting that the final decision has been made are premature. In reality, nothing has been decided. It is not clear at this point what will happen. All we know right now is that there will be repositories built and that land will be nationalized. Mediation is a big problem today, but even this problem hasn't been solved yet. Without consulting with us, with the people that is, Fukushima Prefecture announced that people will be relocated for 30 years, but they failed to keep this promise as well. It's all very unreasonable. All the unpopular decisions were made without us. That's why I've been saying all this time, no, this is not an option. Now, in the beginning of the program, you have touched upon the inability of TEPCO to manage the situation on the nuclear plant. They have been struggling to contain the situation for over three years now. Why are they failing? Where are they going wrong? That's the way TEPCO works. The problem is with its structure. People working at the head office are in privileged conditions, but those working in the field are having a hard time. That's the way it was even before the accident. That's how this company operates. When the accident happened, TEPCO couldn't give us, or even its own employees, the names of the people responsible for the accident. They couldn't do that because there aren't any real professionals there. 
Even before the accident, I would sometimes go to their office as mayor, ask them a lot of questions. How do you train your staff? Is everything all right? Is there any chance that your old equipment may fail? In response, I got only nice words. But they didn't take any practical steps. They hardly ever did anything. TEPCO thinks too high of itself, delegating almost everything to subcontractors. That's why, when something happens, there is nobody to be held accountable. In addition, the company is not on top of the situation on the ground. Even today, we received a report saying that they made a mistake and used the wrong pump, and as a result, contaminated water ended up where it shouldn't have ended up. This is the kind of news we are still getting. As for the restoration of the city, I am gravely concerned about the future of my hometown, the future of Futaba. You know, there is information nowadays that Japan's homeless are among those recruited to take part in the major cleanup. I mean, are they a viable workforce in this case? Is this because there's a lack of qualified workers or because those people are considered sort of disposable? And is it even true? Is this information even true? Hi. Unfortunately, it's true. If you use workers on a one-off basis, you don't have to watch out for radiation, you don't need to care about their health. We must respect people, care about them. When talking about the Tokyo Olympics in 2020, Prime Minister Abe likes to talk about Japanese hospitality, and he uses this Japanese word, omotenashi, which literally means that you should treat people with an open heart. But in reality, that isn't happening. While Prime Minister Noda was busy promoting himself, authorities began to care less about people who worked at the Fukushima plant. Their equipment was getting worse, preparation was getting worse. So people had to think about their safety first. That's why those who understood the real danger of radiation began to quit. Now we have unprofessional people working there. They don't really understand what they're doing. That's the kind of people who would use the wrong pump, for example, who make mistakes like that. I'm particularly concerned about their leaders. It seems to me their team leaders aren't real professionals. They don't know what they're doing. I am really ashamed for my country. But I have to speak the truth for the sake of keeping our planet clean in the future. The fact that the government was covering up the real scale of the disaster for so long has anything to do with traditional Japanese fear of losing face? They simply wanted to avoid responsibility. No, I understand that, but why keep this quiet for so long? Why didn't they tell the world how bad it really was? Why is that? There were some sad chapters in the history of Japan. The same thing happened with Hiroshima and Nagasaki. The authorities lied to everyone. They said it was safe. They hid the truth. That's the situation we're living in. It's not just Fukushima. Japan has a lot of dark history. What's happening now is a sort of a sacrifice to the past. But talking about Fukushima, the United Nations report on the radiation fallout from Fukushima says no radiation-related deaths or acute diseases have been observed among the workers and the general public exposed. So it's not that dangerous after all, or is there not enough information available to make proper assessments? What do you think? This report is completely false. The report was made by a representative of Japan, Professor Hayano. Representing Japan, he lied to the whole world from the UN podium. When I was mayor, I knew many people who died from heart attacks, and then there were also many people in Fukushima who died suddenly, even young people. It's a real shame that the authorities are hiding the truth from the whole world. We need to admit that many people are actually dying. We're not allowed to say that, but even TEPCO employees, they're also dying. But everyone's keeping mum about it. Do you have an estimate of casualties? I don't, I don't have the numbers with me today. 
Sir, we only need an approximate estimate just to understand the scale of the tragedy you're talking about. Mm, it's a huge responsibility to give specific numbers. It's hard for me because I haven't studied this matter personally. But it's not just one or two people. We're talking about 10 to 20 people who died this way. Well, you said that despite the Fukushima disaster, Japan is planning to build more nuclear reactors, eventually satisfying at least half of its energy needs with nuclear energy. Well, obviously, you're against that, but Japan really has no other choice in terms of energy, does it? Yes, it has. Japan's an archipelago. It has plenty of rivers, tides, ebbs. But hydro energy is not used at all. Why? Because it's not as profitable for big companies. Actually, we can provide electricity for a large number of people, even with limited investment, without taxes. Just use gravity. And we may have so much energy that there will be no need for nuclear plants anymore. We also need to change our laws. There are many laws in Japan, perhaps too many. There are laws about rivers and the ways they're used. We could change laws regarding agricultural water use and start using rivers to produce electricity. Changing just this law alone will allow us to produce a lot of energy. We can solve the problem by using natural energy without contaminating our planet. But this does not appeal to big companies. Because in that case, you won't need big investments, you don't need to build big power plants. It's not that profitable for investors, for capitalists. But people in Japan are beginning to realize that we need to avert nuclear disasters. So 60 to 70 percent of the population are in favor of using natural energy. It took us a long time, but one day we'll follow the example of Europe, of Germany. Have you personally felt the consequences of the catastrophe? Has your health been affected? Yes, I now get tired quicker. It's getting harder to speak. I often get colds. My eyesight's gotten worse. I have a cataract. My stomach hurts. My skin is very dry. My muscles are weak in different parts of my body. These are all the consequences of the catastrophe. Are you receiving any aid as somebody who's been affected by the catastrophe? No, I'm not getting any treatment right now. Actually, there is no place I could go for help. I now live in Saitama. The nearest hospital refused to take me in. So I'm just eating healthy. Hopefully it'll fix me up. Mr. Adogama, first of all, thank you so much for this interview. Thank you for this insight. Thank you for sharing your memories with us. I really hope you do get better. I hope all of the Japanese people who have suffered the consequences get better. And I hope that Japan eventually overcomes this catastrophe and life will go on as usual. Thank you very much for your time and your honesty. We're talking to Katsutaka Idogawa, former mayor of Japanese town of Fukapa that was hit by the Fukushima nuclear disaster. We're talking about the consequences of the catastrophe and how safe it is for people to return to the Fukushima district right now. That's it for this edition of Sophie & Co. We will see you next time. Oh yeah, go on, click the subscribe button. Uh, we need to get subscribe and get this unity stronger and beat YouTube at their own game. Okay, that's what this is about. Like I say, go to the remix button, hit the remix button. That way you'll have this video and, and keep up with this. Otherwise, you know, YouTube's just going to control us, guys, and it's, it's really bad.